Hello and welcome to Man's Model Moments. My last video was part one of looking at this subject, so if you've not seen that yet, you should probably jump off and go and watch that first. Here's a link just in case you need it. In this concluding part, I'm taking the 12 companies that made it through the first three knockout rounds into the final, where I'm going to go into as many aspects as possible into the companies and their products to work out who is the winner. So let me explain what I'll be judging the companies on in this video. I'm going to look at each of the companies and score them for the following criteria. The brand, the product range, the cost and value, boxing, the kits, the build, and accuracy. Now some of these are broken down further, and I'll explain that at the start of each round. Each round will also be scored as follows. First place, 15 points. Second place, 12 points. Third place, 10 points. And then fourth to 12th place, 9 to 1 points, respectively. Now, I'm sure everyone will understand broadly what I mean by a company's brand, but how do we measure that in anything approaching an analytical manner, outside of commissioning some big and expensive market survey? Well, I'm going to look at three aspects of this. Firstly is how established and stable the company is, which goes a long way to develop a name in the marketplace. Second is by how those companies project that brand in their products. The third will be how well respected and reputable the company is. I did tell you this was a deep dive, didn't I? The first part of this is pretty easy, because we simply look at how long each brand has been going. It is complicated a little, however, by the fact that a couple of these companies, specifically Airfix and Ravel, have gone bankrupt in the past, and a couple of them are in an active war, which obviously affects the companies in several ways. In order to grade them then, I've looked at how long each has been in existence, and detracted a year for each time they've changed management, and I've done the same for those companies in countries with active conflicts ongoing. This puts Hasegawa in first place, with Airfix, Tamir and Ravel coming in short order after them. And it's no surprise really, since they've all had around 80 years to develop their names. Now time is one thing, but that doesn't necessarily mean that those companies have learned over that time, especially since some of these brands have had many financial problems over the years. So let's look at how these companies showcase their products. And although we say you should never judge a book by its cover, that's absolutely one of the things that humans do. That's why marketing and brand recognition is so prevalent and important in business today. So let's imagine we're going into a model shop as someone who knows nothing about these brands, a complete newcomer to modeling. We have a modern aircraft model from each of these companies sitting on display, which are going to draw our attention. I've removed all the logos here, and some of these are going to be hard to distinguish unless you're already familiar with them. Okay, so let's add the brands back in. Now a few of these are very eye-catching and also give us no ambiguity about who we are dealing with. This is good, because you want to have that instant recognition so that your customers look at your products first, which may make them buy without looking at your competitors. Or at least it puts you in their mind, and you're going to compare everything you see from that point forward to them. So let's reorganize them into what I think gives the most pull. Now don't worry if you disagree with my personal preference, because it's about more than just this. So let's look at logos now, and how prominent they are. This is really where some of the other companies could really learn from the experience of the old guard of the West, Airfix and Ravel. These both devote about 4% of their box frontage to their logo, making them obvious and unmissable. The company closest to these is ICM, which seems to be taking a lot of winning cues from other companies, though its logo doesn't quite hit half of that, occupying just under 2%. And the worst utilizers of their brand are, perhaps unsurprisingly, the more traditional Japanese companies Hasegawa and Aoshima who don't even devote half a percent of their boxes to their brand. There is another part of the box branding before I move on here, and that is consistency. It's not much use having developed a lovely kit in a box if a consumer doesn't recognize it as one of yours, especially if you've used subtle styling. At the bottom of the pile comes Hobby Boss, Trumpeter and I Love Kit. Now you may think this is not fair considering we're comparing three different brands, but other than the point of them benefiting from this in other areas, the same actually applies here within each single brand. They're a bit of a hot mess, with different styles, logo placements, and even colours between them, giving no real recognisable cues. I even have difficulties when I've an order from my suppliers at the shop to find what's what, and I know what I ordered and have a packing slip. 
Tied for the next worst are Special Hobby and Ayoshima. Ayoshima seem to have consistency with some aircraft, but only sometimes and not with any of their other ranges, which also have no internal consistency. Special Hobby, on the other hand, seem to have some rules, I just can't work out what they are, and they also seem to break them at random points too. The only thing that does seem to unite them is bland artwork, which isn't part of this branding. But don't worry, I'll get to that. Meng do have some consistencies, as you can see here. Same logo placement and size in some case, but then in others they shift about and change colour. Likewise, we have some similar layouts and styles, but then some wildly departing. Tacom are very similar to that, though at least their logo is the same colour, but other fonts and layouts change as though they're trying to find one they like. Next we have the last three Asian companies, again all tied. Recent Hasegawa aircraft boxings are pretty standard, if somewhat uninspiring, with their small white stripe. Their recent armour boxes are completely different however, and their car and ship boxes seem to differ even between themselves. Tamiya kits likewise often display common layouts, even if there are variations in colour, but then the cars, ships and some armour break from this commonality. Academy boxes display a good general consistency, similar to Hasegawa aircraft, but also between ranges, though it seems they're tweaking this often to find what works best. We then move to Europe once again for the masterclass in branding for the top spots. In fourth place we have Airfix. Airfix have a few different standard layouts, the box with the side stripe and red stripe at either top or bottom, and then the vintage classics layout. This does muddy the waters a little, and does confuse some people a bit, but compared to any of what we've seen before this, it's light years ahead. Next up is ICM, who use the same text and logo layout on almost every box regardless of range, sometimes adjusted in position to accommodate the box art. Demonstrating that exact principle in operation is Svesta. They have almost identical layouts between all ranges, with only minor deviations apart from their snapfit kits, though these still incorporate the same elements and colours. These all draw the eye and make the boxes unmistakably from a single company. The real master of uniformity with recent releases here, though, is Ravel. It doesn't matter what range, what subject or scale, Ravel imposes corporate identity on it. The only deviations are for big franchises like Star Wars, but the same basic layout and elements still exist even here. Now combining all of those elements of branding, we end up with Ravel and Airfix neck and neck at the top, closely followed by Svesta. Now branding is all very well and good, but a long-standing company with recognisable and consistent branding is only an asset if your company isn't a screw-up. So the last element we're going to consider for the company is its reputation and recognition within the modelling community. Now, whilst this is somewhat subjective, I know a fair few YouTube modellers who have voiced their opinions about companies, plus there's the feedback I get from videos from a wide range of people across the world, so this is at least a subjective assessment based on a broad range of people. If you vehemently disagree with any of these, know that this is one third of the score for one round of this contest, and even if I reverse the order of these, it's unlikely to radically change the final winner. So I think it's a fairly safe bet to say that Tamiya has probably the overall most solid reputation in the modeling world. Others might make better kits, and Tamiya have made mistakes, but these are deviations from a long forged and consistent baseline. The next two companies I really only hear positives about are Tacom and Meng Model. It may be because they're pretty new, and so they haven't had the pressures of a larger, more established business, or that they are using modern techniques like CAD and slide moulding right from the outset, but I really hear complaints about what they produce or how they do things. Next is ICM. I must admit that I've only been impressed with what they've been doing of late, though I know some people have been burned by some of their earlier kits, and I experienced this myself with their MiG-29 Ghost of Kiev. It's not of the same standard as what they're producing today, so they can't really score higher than this because of those legacy items. The order of the next two I am sure will be controversial, because I've actually put Trumpeter, Hobby Boss and I Love Kit ahead of Airfix. Now I know some people will bemoan some accuracy issues of these former companies, but I also hear from people that have actually built their kits that they are really good. They also produce kits no one else does, and many people swear by them, though I have also heard that it can be difficult to get replacement parts. On the other hand, 
Airfix has been doing a lot of things right over the past decade, producing some truly stunning kits, and it has a great design team with some good media people. They also do some silly things, their media works with some better than others, and there are anecdotes both positive and negative about them. Overall, I think Airfix still has more baggage associated with them than the negatives that the Chinese companies have, which is why I've scored them lower here. But you could switch these around if you'd like, and it'd have no impact on the final overall result as well. Next we have Hasegawa, which I think built a great reputation in the 1980s, which it really hasn't moved on from. Its kits are often seen as accurate, but sparse, and expensive for what you get. They used to be cutting edge, but now they feel a bit more staid and pedestrian compared to what else is available out there. Then we have Academy, who strike me as a sort of Asian equivalent to Airfix. I must admit I'm rather fond of Academy kits, but some people really hate them, though I'm not entirely sure why. Much like Hasegawa, they often don't have the same general availability as other manufacturers, so changing that perception can be a long task. Svesta is next, and it suffers from a few things here. It does make reasonably priced kits which tend to have slightly soft detail, sometimes some fit issues, but also some subjects that are difficult to find elsewhere, at least until the Chinese manufacturers wade into the game. It now also has to deal with the fact it's a Russian company, who just really done it no favours in the last couple of years, private or not, is still paying taxes to a government involved in an aggressive invasion of a sovereign neighbour. I've put Aoshima next, not because I hear especially bad things about it, what I do hear is generally positive, it's just they don't really have much of a general reputation, at least in the modelling circles I've been party to, which means it's not really covering a broad part of the market. I have models from more than 90 companies in my personal stash, and it doesn't include Aoshima. Second to bottom then is Special Hobby. They have a reputation of making difficult kits of unusual subjects. The reason you used to buy a Special Hobby kit is because no one else does the subject. Those who buy them generally know this, but that doesn't mean it's also not true. I think Special Hobby have come a long way since then, and I was certainly surprised by some of the quality of their new kits. In last place then is Ravel. I know some of you will disagree, but I hear more grumbling and dissatisfaction about Ravel than just about all other companies combined, with the possible exception of Airfix. In Airfix's case, however, I also hear an equal or greater amount of positive things. Ravel has far less proponents prepared to back its dubious practices. The most heinous crimes it commits tend to be those of passing off old rope as new, often that belong to someone else in the past as well. The positives I hear are generally about its customer care department, rather than defending kits or terrible reboxings. Ravel wasn't helped by its bankruptcy and the perception that the company is not investing as it needs to, but rather just milking old tools to the unwary. None of these are good rumours to hear. Now if we combine all of those elements and rank them, we get our first scores for this video and round 4 overall. In joint first we have Tamiya and Airfix. Both have long histories, Tamiya has a fantastic reputation, Airfix has great branding, and both have solid performances in their respective secondaries. We then have a three-way tie for third place between ICM, Hasegawa and Ravel, with each obviously having a very different mix to get there. This is obviously very early days though, so let's turn our attention to the model kits they produce in round 5. Now we already used part of a company's range as our round 2 qualifier, so why am I revisiting it now? Well, round 2 was a qualification step, round 5 is much more granular. Here I'm going to look at how many toolings a company has created itself, not reboxings or modifications, the average age of those toolings, what is actually available now, and a more detailed critique of exactly how broad their ranges are. The number of new tools each of these manufacturers has created, which is a measure of the contribution they've made to the modelling world. Here, once again, the older companies should have a distinct advantage, but you can see that's not always the case. Now, because I didn't want to spend a year researching this video, I have used the company's entire range to determine their average tooling age. Now you might say this is slightly unfair to the older manufacturers like Airfix, Ravel, Hasegawa, Tamiya and Aoshima, but on the flip side of this, all of these manufacturers still market and sell old kits. Still, to be fair to them, I also looked at the average age of the tools from this century and averaged those, and it made absolutely no difference. Of course, the newer companies do better here, 
but it's not a straightforward relationship between company age and tool age. If we look at Hasegawa here, who are 20 years older than Aoshima as a company, they have a more recent average tool age. Next are the number of kits currently available from the company. Now, this can of course be larger than the number of new tools, since reissues with new parts, schemes and so on is common. Some manufacturers also don't have a lot of their back catalogue available, or even some of their more recent toolings, as we see from manufacturers like Airfix and Revell. This obviously isn't ideal, since it's no good knowing a company makes a certain model you want if they haven't issued it in the last 5 or 10 years. Finally, we have the product mix, or rather, product balance. Here I've looked at what the companies offer compared to that theoretical optimum mix based on market demand. This isn't perfect, but again, it's close enough for our purposes until we have a definitive poll of the modeling community. This shows us where a company is deviating from that ideal mix to appeal to most modelers, rather than concentrating on certain areas. This data, of course, should reflect what we instinctively feel, and if you look at a few examples, that certainly seems to be the case. For example, TACOM is mostly focused on 135th scale vehicles, Aoshima has a long tradition of car models, many of the bigger brands have a preference for making aircraft, and space, sci-fi and other subjects are generally neglected. If we add the absolute values of these together, it gives us a ranking of who best provides a balanced portfolio to serve the community as a whole. Now some of you may be surprised that Ravel has done so well here, but given the way that they have operated over the years, it's really not if you think about it. Ravel do cover a very broad range, and they seem to know the kinds of subjects their customers want. Let's have a look at what the round 5 scores do to the overall results. As we can see, Tamiya have moved out to first place, with their fix and Ravel on their heels. That's perhaps not surprising, given that the first round should really be easier to score highly on with a more established company. Having said that, the Chinese juggernaut of Zhongchang Yatai are pushing their way up the table. Now some people will ask what packaging has to do with being the best company, but if you've ever received a broken kit because of a crappy box, had a scratch canopy because it wasn't bagged, or bought a kit solely on the basis of the box art, you've answered your own question. Now a good box has to do several things. It has to attract the buyer, protect the kit when shipped to the manufacturer and end user, and protect the parts within it before and during the build. Now we've already covered the branding aspect, but the box art is equally as important, especially for those unfamiliar with a brand or younger modelers. I can tell you from retail experience, all box art does sell kits. Just look at Airfix's old Roy Cross boxes, and poor art will also put people off, which of course limits your general market appeal. So let's look at box art first, and I'm judging these boxes on how exciting the subject looks and how well the art is executed. I won't describe all of these exhaustively, but I'll give you a couple of examples of the best and the worst. First up is Academy. The graphics here are a pretty high bar to start with. There really aren't any here that aren't very good, whether they are photographs of real subjects or artwork. Where they fall down a little is on excitement. They're not really evoking much emotion here, it's just showing the subject. FX follows this and raises the bar quite a bit. The quality of FX artwork is pretty high, from those old Roy Cross artworks to the new digitally painted stuff, it's right up there. There are a couple which fall a little short in my opinion, but they more than make up for that by injecting some action into the works. This evokes a much better sense of the subject than a bland picture of a tank on a white background, and it invites you in. You can see that aptly demonstrated in the next brand, Aoshima. Here you have generally really nicely rendered work, with some noticeable exceptions, <coughs> Airwolf, but in the blandest way possible. Never has a panther tank looked so pedestrian. The Zhongchang Yatai brands are all generally pretty terrible in terms of artwork quality, but I think the worst example here is Special Hobby. They combine bland and static poses with suspect art featuring pretty washed out colours that just give a generally uninspiring feel to their kits. The even more important job the box does is protect the contents, both in the warehouse, during shipping, and when you have the kit at home. I've compared the style of box and thickness of cardstock used to give us a general ranking for the box. Again, I won't go through this exhaustively because I don't want this video to be three hours long, but I'll showcase the best and the worst. The best boxes in the business are from ICM and Zvezda. Both of these companies use sturdy, corrugated flip-top boxes, further protected by either a top-opening lid 
or a complete enclosure. I think the top opening lid of ICM is better than Zvezda's complete enclosure, since it has more utility during the stage when you're building the kit, whereas the enclosure is a bit of a faff and so is likely to be put to one side or discarded once you start the kit, meaning you just then have a blank box, which can be confusing if you've more than one kit on the go. These boxes are a standard, cost-effective solution to boxing. They're made from one piece of card, fold into shape, which gives you three sides that are double thickness, and they aren't printed, making them very easy to recycle. Larger manufacturers could take some notice here. This is something that could easily be implemented into most manufacturers' processes with minimal changes. Other manufacturers go part of the way here by using this type of corrugated lower to their top opening boxes, but many just use standard single ply card of various thicknesses, and I did measure similar sized boxes to eliminate variation due to larger or smaller boxes too. One manufacturer stands out here though, and not in a good way, Ravel. Ravel use end opening boxes for the great majority of their kits, though this has not always been the case, they use top opening boxes around the turn of the millennium, so they've actually gone backwards. End opening boxes have a host of disadvantages, and the first one may not be the one that you automatically think of, it's actually mechanical strength. As each of the walls is only a single sheet of card thick, and the only thing resisting any downwards force on the box is the shape made by tucking the end tabs in, they are much weaker for any given size and card thickness. A top opening box resists the force on all four sides, and the tabs forming the shape are typically glued or stapled and not just tucked in. This has practical implications on warehousing and shipping in terms of carton size, stacking height, and so on. It affects how you can display them in a model shop, and because they are fully printed they are also slightly harder to recycle, though this is not something we generally see as modelers. The other set of problems with end opening boxes of course is for the modeler. They don't fully seal. So if you use them to store the kit after starting, you can lose parts through the gaps. You can also only access the contents from one end, so you have to pour or slide things in and out, not exactly ideal for an in-progress kit. As such, many of us modelers tend to ditch them and rebox after we open them, which is not exactly an ideal solution. So why do they do it? It's cost. Which, given a lot of the prices we see, just feels like they're more interested in money than modelers. I mean, it's not like they aren't going to pass on the cost to us anyway, so give us a decent box please, Ravel. I'll also mention Airfix here too, because they are a bit variable. Some kits come really well boxed in sturdy, top opening boxes, whereas in others, the Sea Fury is a good example, the card of the box is way too thin for its size, making the box flimsy and even flexible. The starter boxes are also end opening, I'm guessing for a cost rationale, but I would really say that a starter needs a box they can store everything in properly more than the rest of us, and I doubt any small price increase due to the box would break the value proposition here. Next I'm going to look at the other elements of protection once you get inside the box. Is the box full? This sounds silly, but it has a practical side effect aside from the feeling of value, in that kit frames rattling around a half-empty box are way more likely to get damaged, and we all know the famous care postal services show parcels. Also, how many of the frames are bagged? Are the transparencies bagged separately? Are the decals bagged? Are those bags recyclable? Do kit elements come with any other protective measures, like foam around fragile items or separate sub-boxes for key components? Again, there was a huge amount of stuff to go through here, but I'll keep it short. Generally, Asian companies do better here. Most Japanese companies are masters of QC, and so bag everything. This culture has spread throughout Southeast Asia, but notably the Chinese here have become the gold standard, and specifically the Zhongshan Yatai group of companies. Whether aircraft, vehicle, or ship, getting product to you as it left the factory seems to be a top priority. Subboxes, strengthening bridges, foam around key parts, as well as very strong boxes really give you the feeling of thought being put in here. The big western manufacturers also now use recyclable plastic bags. Kudos to them for that, though I noticed Hobby Boss and Trumpeter also do this now, so we can't really say the western companies have an advantage here. This brings me to the last element of this, and that is the environmental impact of all this packaging. It's great to protect what we've bought, but ideally we want to do that in as sustainable a way as possible. Less colour print on the box helps, as does reducing the amount of non-recyclable plastic. As I already mentioned, Airfix, Revell, and the Zhongshan Yatai group achieves this by using recyclable bags, 
At ICM, do it by bagging things minimally, but without compromising other factors like room for movement in the bag and box. Adding all of these elements together, and it's Airfix and ICM that actually come out on top, with Ravel dead last, even with some green credentials. So change those awful boxes, Ravel. This does move things about in the overall order, with Airfix nudging ahead of Tamiya and ICM taking up a strong third place. Let's see what happens once we have our goods in store and you go to buy them. So you may have heard of our brands. You go to the shop and see the boxes on the shelves. You pick one you see with a bright logo, nice artwork and sturdy box. Everything looks and feels good. And then you see the price. Which of these manufacturers is going to have you taking that box to the checkout? And which are going to give you sticker shock? Well, this is not as easy a question to answer as you might think. These companies don't all make the same models. Some are sold direct, whereas others you can only get from retailers. And all of this is complicated by actual sales price, offers and regionality. So what I've done is look at the most common scales of armor, aircraft and cars and compare medium recommended retail prices across each of the manufacturers and then average those out for each manufacturer. I'm just considering prices in the UK and to make things easier, I'm using Hannance as the reference so there's consistent reported prices, but I'm ignoring any sale prices or reductions and so forth. Now, the picture is further complicated by the fact that many of these companies aren't consistent across their ranges. For example, a Ravel 172nd aircraft is likely cheaper than an Airfix 172nd aircraft, but Ravel's 172nd armor is on average double the Airfix price. Hasegawa makes some very reasonable 172nd scale aircraft, but is eye-wateringly expensive for everything else. Tamiya's average price is actually cheaper than Airfix's because it tends to price by the age of its tooling, whereas a new tool is likely more expensive. As always, we need to take a step back and look at the wider picture and put the caveat here that of course your anecdotal experience may be different. You may have good deals on a particular manufacturer near you, say a local model shop that gives good discounted prices, similar to the Airfix Club, but across all manufacturers, such as Man's Model Moments, for instance. But in fairness, we can't consider that and have to take what the manufacturer intends for its customers. We should also consider what value this represents, since even in a genre like 172nd aircraft, there's a lot of variation. So without comparing thousands and thousands of individual prices across each of these brands, let's try to normalize the figures. If we take a kit from each of these brands at the medium price point, we can look at a couple of things to do this. Firstly, how many parts are you getting at that price point? And what size of model do you end up with? This should help in getting an idea of what you're getting for your money, as well as the absolute cost. We want to do this for different types of kit too, so I'm specifically looking at 172nd aircraft and 135th scale armor, as they're the most broadly represented across these companies. Again, that gives us a varied picture, but combining these value calculations with the price points evens out the troughs and peaks and gives us a broad view of where these kits are situated in the market. Now, I imagine there will be quite a few people that will be surprised to see Tamiya in the top spot here, including me, to be honest. But that's because, as I mentioned earlier, Tamiya tend to base the pricing of their models based on their tool age, which goes across all of their different model subjects too. So unless you're looking at buying the latest toolings, and contrary to popular myth, Tamiya is actually one of the most affordable brands out there. And they also provide a lot for their price points too. Special Hobby is next, with some extremely good value propositions and keenly priced items, and Ravel follows them, though their pricing across types is highly variable. Looking at what that does to the overall positions, Tamiya again swaps places with Airfix, with ICM holding on to its strong third place, Zhongchang Yatai and Academy hold their positions, but Ravel pushes out in front of Hasegawa. There's a bit of jostling about at the bottom of the pack, but with 42 points of differential still available, no company is out of the running to win. And now we move on to the areas that many of you, I am sure, have been waiting for, the models themselves. Looking at the models the company produces, as you might expect, I'm going to look at several elements. The instructions, the production of the plastic, the detail included, the build options given, and the schemes that have been catered for. The simplest of these are the instructions. Companies like Airfix, Academy, and Ravel have really upped their game here in recent years, as you might expect and have probably seen. That's just as well, because other companies have not rested on their laurels either. 
ICM are the obvious example of a much younger company really leading the way here in terms of clarity, quality and consistency, but I was also really surprised by how good modern special hobby instructions are. Really impressive and a far cry from some of their original offerings. It astonishes me then that companies like Hasegawa, Aoshima and even Tamiya in some respects have really not changed at all, with cluttered black and white fold-out sheets reminiscent of something from the mid-1970s. ICM are the ones that really excel here, however, by going that extra step as they are now providing 3D animated instructional videos, which is very forward-thinking and is genuinely helpful rather than just gimmicky. Take note here, more established companies, please. Moving to our second aspect of the kit, and what I'm sure many will feel is of critical importance, the production of the plastic. This again is a relatively easy thing to actually quantify, and I've measured dozens of injection gates, wing trailing edges, panel line thicknesses and depths, ejector pin marks, and flash across each of these brands. Now I did standardize what pieces I measured to eliminate any personal bias, and summed all of this up to rank the companies in what they're actually giving us in terms of plastic. It's maybe no surprise again that Tamiya tops out this category, but I was really surprised to see Revell score so highly, and Airfix come dead last here. Now we are talking about literally differences of a fraction of a millimetre in some cases, so it's not that Airfix are bad, instead it just shows how good these companies are today. What is also important is consistency. For example, Tamiya just didn't come top here, they aced every single thing measured. Part gates, part thicknesses, panel lines, all of it. One thing I haven't mentioned here, outside of flash and ejector pin marks, is QC and customer care. That's because it's very difficult for us to know objectively what that looks like for each of these companies, and they're unlikely to share that anytime soon. What I was going to do is give Airfix a penalty for its poor QC, but in fact it would make no difference to the result in any case, so I haven't actually done that. I've said it before however, and I'm sure I'll say it again, get a grip of your QC airfix. Likewise, customer care is not something that should factor in, since it's a solution to a problem. An ideal company doesn't need to fix QC issues because they don't exist. Customer care experiences are also highly anecdotal, so I've not considered them at all. For build options, I've looked at 10 kits in the last five years that the companies have given us, split across various genres, to see what choice they're providing. Is it, this is what you build, if you want anything else, you go to the aftermarket, or here is a box of possibilities. Again, this is very easy to measure and summarize, and these ZY brands come out on top here, which is probably why we feel they give us a lot, because they do. Airfix also do much better here, as do the Japanese companies. For schemes, I've done a similar thing. What options does the company provide, along with how have they executed this. The standards are very high here. Though again, some companies do notably push ahead, and they're some of the youngest contenders, TACOM and ICM. One reason for that is that, unlike traditional manufacturers, they tend to provide options for things like naval and civilian subjects, as well as just providing more options in the military field. All of this should give us a broad idea of what the manufacturer is providing us in the box. We're unconcerned with value here, as we've already looked at that, we're looking at the kit alone. As you've heard Tamiya scoring highly in each of these individual fields, it's unsurprising then that they come out with the top spot in this category, and by some margin. Academy surprised me though by coming second, followed very closely by another surprising tie, ICM and Ravel. I should also say that more points separated Tamiya from fourth place than the points between fourth and last. So we are looking at the smallest of differentials here, showing just how well we are served today by these companies. Okay, we've got our kit and it looks lovely. Now what about putting it together? I've had lovely looking, beautifully detailed kits in the past, which have turned out to be absolutely horrible when it's come to actually putting them together. Dragon, I'm looking at you here. So how do our current crop compare? Well, again, I want to try to avoid any subjectivity here, so let's look at what we can measure. Firstly, we can look at the properties of the plastic. How hard it is, how brittle, how easily does it bond together, and so on. We can look at how well parts fit together, and we can look at complexity. How small and fiddly are the parts, and how many of those small parts do we have to deal with? 
Do we have resin or photo etch parts that we have to use, which will limit the ease of build and scope for the model for less experienced modelers? Finally, I'm going to look at what a company does to lower that threshold for less experienced modelers with easier to build options, like a choice of tracks in a tank kit or a starter set, for instance. Now, those elements that made our younger companies score well in prior categories come back to haunt them here. I doubt anyone would argue that a Meng or Tacom AFV is easier to build than an Academy Airfix or Tamiya one. Not that the fit of the parts isn't good, but the sheer number of small and fiddly pieces and mandatory use of photo etch complicate things. Manufacturers such as Airfix and Ravel also have starter sets meant to bring people into the hobby, with Airfix standing out here by specifically tooling easy to build kits for this purpose and standing head and shoulders above others in this regard. In the end though, they are just pipped at the post by Tamiya because of slightly better material properties of the plastic and more consistently good fit. Now, for FX to get a smidgen of 5% less than Tamiya's score here is testament to the work that the team have done in the past decade, because it wouldn't have been that close before. I was a little surprised that Hasegawa did so well in this category, but thinking on my personal experience with them, I can't think of a particularly bad build I've had with them, so on reflection, it does kind of make sense. That means that Tamiya is now uncatchable as the leader as we come into that final furlong. But the question is, how close will the race be, and how will the second and third places look? Now, as we build our model, we may notice things that don't seem right, or that align with our research, or we might complete a kit and look at the end result and find it looks off somehow, or is dimensionally inaccurate. This may or may not matter to us as an individual, but I don't think we can truly attest to a company producing scale models to not try to get as close as they can to an accurate representation as is reasonable for the scale and their manufacturing constraints. Now, I don't personally have time to measure hundreds of individual models to get a truly accurate consideration for this important aspect of our hobby, so I did what any reasonable person would do and took the responsibility and asked the community. Now, I had way more responses than I expected, which I thank you all for, and crunching the hundreds of individual pieces of data together this is the ranking, which combines all aspects of accuracy from research and execution to schemes and markings. Now, if you disagree with the results here, you only have yourselves to blame. So with all the results in, we can see Tamiya have dominated the latter stages of the analysis, and though they could still learn a few things from other companies, their consistently high scores led them to victory. Second and third place go to Airfix and ICM respectively, with a narrow margin between them. If we look in a bit more detail at these three brands, you can see that ICM actually scored much more consistently than Airfix, which I think you can intuit as a modeler. Again, I've said this before, but Airfix tends to be a lot more hit and miss than either ICM or Tamiya. Older ICM kits are not up to their current standards, but there aren't many of them, and they still tend to be better than similarly aged Airfix kits. Airfix current kits get mixed reviews, sometimes due to their highly variable QC, sometimes not. They also have their vintage classics, which does expand their range, but they are very different kits from current toolings. Now, Tamiya have won this contest by consistency. They have scored highly in pretty much everything, even when their scores are lower, they're not terrible. I would say that the best of Airfix and ICM can hold their footing one-to-one -one against Tamiya, but the worst of Tamiya is still not that bad, and certainly much better than the worst of either of these two companies. Looking at the middle ground, that aspect of consistency shows again. I didn't honestly expect Academy to come out over Trumpeter and Hobby Boss, but they achieved that by solid performance across the board, whereas the Chinese company does some things brilliantly, but also some things terribly or just not as good as others. Their boxes are a great example of this, very sturdy and practical, with horrible artwork and branding. From a practical standpoint, this is irrelevant, but people aren't solely practical, and in a retail market, it absolutely does matter. The inverse is true of Ravel, of course, who feel a lot more like style over substance. They are absolutely capable of producing excellent kits as well, which makes it even more disappointing that their reputation for reboxing old kits with no clarity 
poor packaging and kits lacking research accuracy let them down so much. Ravel and the Chinese companies are both, however, in an excellent position to be able to challenge the leading brands if they just made a few changes in their focal points. The last of these middle ground companies is Hasegawa, which I feel is a very traditional Japanese company that has failed to capitalize on the position it held at the end of the 20th century. Unlike Tamiya, it has continued to do the same things it did then, which means it's still a solid company making good kits. It just looks uncompetitive because the market is moving quickly around it, and I don't think it's moving with it as it needs to. We then have the backrunners. Once again, these are not bad companies. Remember, this is effectively the Global Modeling Olympics, and we're comparing the best of the best. I'll start with Aoshima, because I think it's very similar to Hasegawa, but less well known in general circles. Its uninspiring boxes and almost absent branding are unlikely to tempt you into buying a brand you've probably not heard of before either. Word of mouth is great, but it's not going to get you to the number one spot in 2024. Unlike them, Tacom and Meng are both growing fast and gaining good reputations. I think Tacom probably needs to diversify more to appeal more widely, and both suffer with what I'll call the mini-art syndrome, a lot of complexity that puts them into more of an intermediate to advanced model and niche. They need to find ways to address that in future, like Hobby Boss and Trumpeter have, with more accessible kits for starters, if they want that wider appeal. Zvezda suffers a couple of issues, one immediate and one is more deeply set. The first is obviously the fact that it's Russian, which is a pariah state right now, with embargoes and general image issues making selling to the market problematic from both a logistic and moral point of view. It's difficult to get kits to retailers, who may not want to stock them, and customers may not want to buy them. The second more deeply set problem with Zvezda is their actual kits. The detail is soft and their instructions are pretty basic. They used to be the go-to manufacturer for Soviet-era subjects, but I feel that mantle has now passed on to the Chinese manufacturers. Finally, we have Special Hobby, which I think is the most surprising company for myself that I've looked at here. I had initially dismissed them as my experience of their kits was really from the late 90s and early noughties, but their recent production kits are fantastic. I honestly think that they need to do more work on their image and promoting themselves there, because if I had that historical view of them, I'm sure it's not even that high for the majority of modelers, which is a shame, and their terrible box art isn't doing justice to the rather nice kit contents. So there we have it, my take on who the best current model company is in the world. I didn't know who would come out on top when I started, though to me, of course, we're always going to be a strong contender. Hopefully I've demonstrated that there are real reasons behind the hyperbole of Tammy's dominance in people's minds, but even given that, they still have room to improve, and they could take a few lessons from younger, more forward-thinking companies like ICM, who I think could easily move up to challenge them in coming years. Airfix have done great work in recent years to gain their second place, but they really need to stabilize their output and become more consistent across their business. I think that revisiting this on an annual basis would be an interesting exercise, and I'll be looking to improve the analysis wherever I can, so let me know in the comments down below how you think I could do that. In researching this video, I also wondered if it might be a good idea to look at specific areas like which is the best aircraft kit company, AFB company, car company, etc., which would open a slightly different suite of companies, Edouard, for example, for aircraft, into the competition. Again, let me know in the comments below if you think that's a good idea and what you think those categories should be. That's all for this instalment of Man's Model Moments. If you enjoyed the video, please click the like button, subscribe to the channel for more like it, and share this video with others you think would also enjoy it. You can also follow me on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, and if you're feeling generous, then I also have a Patreon, which is absolutely the best way of helping me to grow the channel and produce more content like this. With that, I hope you have plenty of modeling moments of your own, and I look forward to welcoming you on the next video.